Hi, I'm John Broxton for the International Film Music Critics Association and I'm very pleased to present the uh, 2023 IFMCA Award for Best Original Score for a Comedy Film to Laura Cartman for oh, American Fiction. Thank you. Great congratulations. Thank you so much. I, I, this is such a great honor. I'm such a fan of all the work that you guys do and the way that you support our industry with mostly nice, sometimes, you know, but... <laughs> No, I'm teasing. It's absolutely terrific, and I feel totally honored to receive this award, especially because you think American fiction is a comedy, so even better. Right. Right? Thank you so much. Well, let me start off with congratulating you on a wonderful 2023 opus. Thank you. It was a really, really good year. I appreciate that. Uh, now, this film, to say that the characters are rather off-center and quirky. Mm -hmm. Could you share with us how you conceived your musical narrative to speak to these characters? Well, I think the, the first thing that's completely obvious is Thelonious Monk, right? So the characters named Monk very pers uh, purposely by Percival Everett, who was the author of the book. And so Monk, the music of Monk is I mean, it's brilliant and it's genius and it's quirky. He has a very particular style of composition and a very particular style of playing, which very much goes with the character, you know, uh, Monk in, in American fiction. So definitely Monk was a major inspiration for me and the, the kind of the, um, you know, the main theme is in 5-4. So, it, it you know, whenever you have a 5-4 cue, mostly there's, it feels like a like a missing step or kind of a like a I, I can't do it any better than I'm doing it. You know, kind of like something that that feels off in a wonderful way. And I think that's the that's the case with the with the music for the movie, at least for Monk's theme. So the idea was to write a piece of music that really embodied the character, but also had the feeling of Thelonious Monk. But it needed to be a film score, you know, so that music had to be able to become touching in the love scenes and had to be able to go through the paces of the kind of theme that you need for a film score. So that was the basic um, nature of that. And then the family theme, which is kind of the second major theme, is quite a bit different. It's It's got this... Um, so it's this kind of almost meandering melody. And the idea is it's always a two-handed thing, right? It's always flute and piano, sometimes flute and voice, uh, sometimes flute and guitar, or a guitar and piano. And, but the two instruments never play together. So it's much like a family where like you're kind of doing the same thing and coming from the same place, but maybe you're not always working together. Um, and then the only place that that theme really comes together in kind of a solid way is in the pool scene, which, it, and it becomes a bop, beep, bop, beep, do, ba, da, ba, da, da. It becomes a samba. So, it, so those are the two things. And then there are other sub themes and other things that happen obviously, but that's kind of the major music material of the film, I think. One of the things I really liked about the score, and I think I, I, I mentioned this in my review, <clears throat> a lot of jazz scores tend to be jazz pastiche. Mm. Yours felt like proper jazz. I appreciate that. Um, and that, that was, I think that was a phrase I used. Yeah. Uh, you obviously have a jazz background. I you do. You study jazz. Can you talk a little bit about how, do you sense a difference between jazz pastiche and actual jazz in film music? Yeah, I think jazz pastiche is just kind of like bluesy. You know, so you got like a little pizzicato and like a blues bend or something like that. You know, it was hard to figure out really how to do it. And basically what I did was write tunes. I mean, I went, honestly, I went through a couple of iterations of it. I did another film this year, a documentary on Rock Hudson. We put people in a studio. I wrote tunes. They played the tunes. We edited them to picture. I added things. I subtracted things. So they were very like accommodated after the recording to picture. And I thought about doing this this way, but the problem is the film is so sensitive dial in in, in the dialogue way 
<coughs> excuse me, that really you have to play with the actors. You have to really think about the actors as almost like other instruments. So it had to be constructed like a cue. So basically what would happen is that I would leave open spots for improvisation, record, everybody isolated, completely isolated, and then take this out, take this out, and then re-record like when somebody had something that was cool that then, you know, became became something. But being that it was thematically based, everything always was grounded in one of those two themes. And there's kind of a third theme that's his um, uh, sort of thinking theme, which is da -do -da, ba -do da That's during the writing sequence and later at the end. Um, so in, a long answer to your question is there's a rhythm section fundamentally through everything. There are soloists, saxophones, trumpet and flute that play on top of that in a very sculpted way, sometimes melodically, sometimes short bursts of improvisation. Um, sometimes it's written out, you know, like, like, you know, one of my favorite scores, John Williams is the uh, Catch Me If You Can. And the whole thing, of course, is notated, the solo and everything. So that very much comes from you know, 1950s, 1960s jazz scores like Lalo Schifrin or, um, you know, certain Elmer Bernstein things, Man with Golden Arm. And so I, there's, there's this huge tradition of scoring jazz in film, right? But it is a hybrid where you have to get in there with a jazz sensibility. You have to get in there with a, with a sense of what jazz harmony truly is and the complexity of it, right? This isn't a simple score and the music is harmonically complex, um, which is why I think it feels like jazz rather than jazzy, but it is very, very much sculpted to picture and carved very carefully with the dialogue. You, uh, you mentioned your, uh, your soloists and the improvisation. That yeah. was something I was going to ask you. How much room was there for that? Because your, your soloists are fantastic. Uh, they are. Yeah. There, there was some room for it, um, and then sometimes not. You know, um, like there's one of the, th I'm, I'm just thinking about a scene. One of the really wonderful scenes in the movie is when a monk and Coraline are walking along the beach and they've, they're just starting their relationship. And it's this, it's the, the most kind of beautiful exploration of the monk theme. And as they're walking, I, I would have my soloist actually do entire takes over, sorry about the dog barking. But it's nighttime, and I have a great Pyrenee, and she will bark. But anyway, so the, you know, I would have the sax solo during uh, the whole thing, then the flute solo the whole thing, and then take things out and kind of move them around, and then redo them, you know, so that it was really, as I say, this kind of like almost pointillistic approach to, to fitting the jazz in with the dialogue, yeah. improvisation in with dialogue. So obviously, you know, this was your first Oscar nomination that you got for, the, for that this year. Um, talk to me a little bit about that experience. I mean, you became sort of the, the fashion queen of the red carpet. <laughs> I, did, I loved it. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, obviously your first nomination. So what, what was that all like? Well, I mean, there's a lot to say about it. I mean, you know, never, ever, ever did I ever, ever think it would happen to me. And, um, there, there's so many layers of, of what this means. You know, I've been working in the business for a very long time, for 35 years. As you know, and there's no reason to, to you know, there's big girl again. There's no reason to kind of pretend like it's not the case. These opportunities were just not available to women and other underrepresented groups. So it's only in the past few years. You know, w there have been six Oscar nominations. The first three... No, the first two were in the 90s for Rachel Portman and Ann Dudley. Then it was all that time until Michael Levy got one in uh, 2017 or 18, then Hilder and then Jermaine, and, um, and then me. So what you're looking at is the result of the opening of our field and the result of a lot of advocacy that a lot of people have done. Um, so I, I have, I, I never ever thought I would benefit personally from my work in advocacy. It was not done for that purpose. I couldn't have conceived of it happening in that way, but it did. And it's incredible. Everybody who worked on American fiction, everybody was elevated 
by the film. Everybody's careers were elevated. Everybody was elevated emotionally. Um, it was an extraordinary piece of work, and uh, you know, Cord is a, an incredible writer and director. And we had tremendous support from the studio. I mean, MGM. Well, it helped. It 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 didn't even help. It was like I've never been treated like that. You know, there were cars, there was hair, there was a budget for clothes, and and it, and all of that seems like superfluous but it's not because part of of doing these kinds of campaigns is that you want to feel good right you want to have a feeling of confidence you want to feel like your your full self and i think for me like when we talk about 2023 i was my full self i was my full self in writing the score for the marvels in all of its kind of orchestral glory and i was my full full self with american fiction because you know, I'd done jazz scores, but they were never acknowledged or noticed. And the fashion thing is not nothing either, you know. In many, many ways, um, I found my way to be able to express myself in the way that I was able to look. And there is a lot going on with the fashion choices I made as well. That's like beautiful. advocacy choices. You know, did you read any of that stuff that I wrote about it? Not specifically, no. Okay, so... Do you want to know? Job, yeah. Sure. Okay. So basically, um, I I made two, the two major choices were for the nominees' lunch and for the Oscars. We all knew Ludwig was going to win an Oscar, right? right? Yeah. There, I, I pretended there were moments, <laughs> you know, where I pretended, but it like yeah. the minute I saw that movie and heard Ludwig's score, I thought, okay, that's it. That's long before American fiction hit Toronto or anything like that. Right. So what I did is for the nominees lunch, when voting was still open, I wanted to be in gold tones because I had, I, when I was a governor, Laura Dern had, had done, um, the, like announced the names and she was like wearing a gold dress. She looked like an Oscar. And so I wanted to be in these gold tones. So I wore these like beautiful um, Gucci pajamas, essentially like a robe and, and pants. Um, I wore them on purpose because I wanted to reclaim the bathrobe from Harvey Weinstein wow. and use it for female empowerment. And then I did the same thing at the Oscars. The Oscars were silver because I wanted to come in a shiny second. Now, who knows if I did or not, but that's what, that's what I was going with, you know? And, and so I just, I, I went really, um, really, really had a lot of fun with, with super loud silvers. And then um, I was looking for a splash of color and I found this incredible Cadbury, um, Cadbury, Cadbury um, bag by Anya uh, Hinmarch. It's just fantastic. And then I thought, oh my God, we have to fill this up with chocolate because I was a governor and I knew what the story would be, right? The, the journalists, you know, the photographers are there and then all the seat warmers are there as you walk by. Right. So I just thought, this is just going to be fun. I'm just going to have fun with it. Because, you know, it was the last moments <laughs> before Ludwig was going to win, you know, but, but, I really, but I really wanted to celebrate. And, and I think our, you know, our motto around here um, for all of it was just we are looking at this as a celebration for an absolute honor that I never thought I would receive. Um, and it was a, an absolutely spectacular time and a lot of work and hard in some ways too. Cause you know, it's every night you're out and sometimes two or three events and you know, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Seeing you and Nora str striding down the red carpet. Yeah. And our son, Benny too. <laughs> yeah. And our son, Benny. So we, we had a great time. Yeah. That actually leads into something that I also wanted to talk to you about, which is your work with the uh, Alliance for Women Film Composers. Yeah. Um, you and uh, Lolita Ritmanis and Miriam Cutler. Yes, yes. So you were mentioning about, you know, there's all these women recently have been getting much more acclaim. Do you think that your advocacy through this organization has been a leader for that, like a catalyst? I mean, because it's certainly, yes. there's been a noticeable change. Yeah, for absolute sure. Yeah. Because you have to look at, sort of the history of the last 10 years, right? It's the 10-year anniversary of the, of the Alliance. When we started, people said there were no women composers. And basically, we started the organization when um, we had um, 
uh, Martha Loudson, who does, re does research on, on gender equity in, or lack thereof in, in Hollywood, included composers in her statistics for the first time. So we were 2% of the top 250 box office films in 2013. And the nice thing about that, it was an unassailable number right? So we would talk amongst ourselves every once in a while, you know, we would get together and at various events and, you know, it was, it was always like all the, you know, the ASCAP, the BMI awards, those were always like painful events for us because we were never on stage and it was always all guys and it was, it, the, and, and anyway, um, so the first thing we did at the Alliance is we created a, a directory, which is like, well, here are 30 women composers, and then it was 50, and then it was 500, and then and it grew and grew and grew. Um, when I, when, frankly, I think because of the Alliance, um, I was admitted to the Academy in 2015, and then I became a governor in 2016, because at that time, too, the Academy was looking to diversify and I'd established myself as a leader in the field. When I got there, there were, um, I was the third woman composer who had been admitted. The first two were Rachel and Ann Dudley. And I was the first woman admitted in over 20 years. That's astonishing. It is and it isn't. Yeah. And then that very first year, we brought in Jermaine, Catherine Bostick, I mean, uh, Heather McIntosh, Tara Stinson, I mean, all, uh, you know, all of the people that we know, um, you know, Raphael Sadiq, I mean, ton, like, literally people who always should have been in. And then it, it, it grew and grew, grew, grew every year. So basically, you know, our, one of our goals with the Alliance was to diversify um, the Recording, uh, you know, Television and Motion Picture Academy because part of what happens is when you have people who are looking at a, a, a range of material, you see also interesting votes, yeah. right? Like Lolita got on the short list for her very small film. The, 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 the Latvian. Right, right, the Latvian movie that very few people had seen, but because it? it's a beautiful score and because people know her in the community, yeah. She got on the short list. And that's one of the reasons when I was a governor, um, I have to claim credit for the short list because that was really my doing. And it was for this very reason, because on a short list, you see an immediate elevation, right? Immediately you see diversity and you see, you know, scores that might not go on to win uh, or even get a nomination. but hey, they're on a short list, and that makes a difference. And it makes a difference in terms of what the studio will put in and the kind of firepower that you have. In many ways, what was needed is someone to establish a beachhead. Yeah. To open up the door. Yeah, we have to keep it open. They're not going to open it for you. No, they're not. And I remember when I first walked into the boardroom at the academy, and, I mean... It's very intimidating. It's on this, the seventh floor, and it overlooks literally Hollywood and the Hollywood sign in the background. I walked in. It was super crowded, and I just thought to myself, I'm going to sit at this goddamn table if it's the last thing I have to do. And I squeezed in between Michael Giacchino and Laura Kennedy, and there, there was literally no room. And I brought a chair over, and I said, hey, can I sit here? You know, yeah, come on in. But it was like really, like, it sounds like a small thing, but it was very, very important for me to literally sit at that table. And it's, it's a lot. You know, it takes... Um, It's not, I'm not fearless because I have fears, a lot of them, but you just have to at a certain point say, I can't leave this this way. It's not healthy. It's not healthy for the men either. It's not healthy for anybody. And, and when, when an entire class of people, you know, either by gender or by, by race or by anything is denied a voice, especially in something like music, that's not good for any of us, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's also interesting, you know, you mentioned Miss Marvel and, and the Marvels. 
um, you know, I was doing a little bit of research before we were doing this interview, and you're only the fourth woman ever to score a superhero franchise. So Shirley Walker, Lolita with all the Batman and Superman yeah. stuff, Pinar Toprak, right. and now you. Right. I mean, that's that's a step in the right direction in itself, but again, it is. it's still not enough. But, well, but, you know, Marvel has been really, like, wonderfully open. Yeah. I mean, they, they've hired me. Natalie Holt has yeah. been there. Yeah. Uh, Amy Dougherty. Um, yeah. There are other people, I think, who are working there right now. I don't know if those projects have been announced. But, um, you know, and I think it's because uh, Kevin loves music. He loves music. He's got open ears. And he is willing to listen to what, you know, to what people are doing. And, you know, and they've been, I think Marvel has many ways been leaders in hiring uh, diverse voices in, in music composition. Yeah. I mean, Chris Bowers has worked there, you yeah, know. That's right. Um, and yes, I mean, talking about the Marvel, I mean, that score is fantastic. Thank you. I think that um, we were talking earlier. I think that the, the comparative lack of success of the movie meant that what you were doing for that score was unfairly overlooked because there's so much going on in that score. There's so much content and it, it just feels like, I mean, again, it's talk about proper jazz. This feels like a proper superhero score. There's not, proper jazz in it too. There is. Nobody notices, <laughs> but it's Star Ben's theme is like it's yeah. really jazzy. Yeah, and it's Elena playing flute again. Um, but it, it, you know, it because again, it's the same. It's exactly the same conversation as with the Oscars. I was given the resources. Mm. Right. So it's MGM gave me the resources to really be able to campaign successfully the whole time. Pre shortlist, post shortlist, pre nomination. Marvel gave me the resources to realize a vision that I had always had, but had never been able to lay out. I mean, I could do anything I wanted. I wanted I recorded three different choirs. I recorded Dame Evelyn Glennie. You know, we went over to Abbey Road with I mean have you ever been there? Uh, just once. I mean... That's a studio and a half, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Yeah. It's, uh, my, my assistant Amelia said, um, we were describing it to Elena, um, and we were saying, it's, she said, I'm not religious, but that was like a religious experience, you know? And so that, that was really, and we loved every minute of it. Nora conducted the score. She did a great job. Um, we, we, stayed in a beautiful hotel you know it's just like it's heaven it's heaven you know it was that's not an unusual circumstance for a person scoring a tent pole studio movie. no so you should be doing that of course you should be scoring tent pole studio movies you betcha but i still appreciated every moment of it yeah you know and i think that if there's any advantage to having waited so long for all of this I think that's the advantage because it is all so sweet now. And I take not one moment of it um, for granted. None of it. Yeah. You know, it's very special. Well, thank you, Laura. Many congratulations. Again. Thank you so much. Continued success. Thank you. thank you so much. Thanks for coming out.